My name is Padraig Sheeran and I am a grandson of Constable Patrick Sheeran from the Royal Irish Constabulary of 1912 to 1920 who was involved in the Listow Mutiny in June and July of 1920. Patrick was born in Strayed in Foxford on the 16th of March 1892. His family were huge supporters of Michael Davis in the Land League in Strayed something which had a significant influence on Patrick as he was growing up. He joined the RIC on the 16th of March 1912 at the age of 20 years. After six months training in Phoenix Park, he was stationed in Glen Bay from 1912 to 1914, in Cologlin from 1914 to 1917, and in Listowel from 1917 to 1920. He married Margaret Morrissey, uh, in April 1920. By the time of the mutiny, he had been serving in his soul barracks for in excess of two years. He was a tall strapping man at well over six foot. He was a very forthright and conscientious man, a man of integrity and highly regarded as being too principled for his own good. He had most to lose by taking part in this mutiny as he was living in Brosna Kerry, only 15 miles away, with a new wife. To just discuss the details of the mutiny, on the 17th of June 1920, the police in Listowel received orders from headquarters to hand over the barracks to the British military, that all but one constable were to be transferred to the outlying huts or stations in the district where they were now to act as scouts for the troops, which was a very dangerous new development. The constables in the list old barracks held a meeting. It was agreed that Constable Mee would be their spokesman, and they agreed that they would not obey these orders, and they communicated this to their superiors. Either later on the 17th of June or on the 18th the next day, the County Inspector, Poor O'Shea, came to the stole to force the constable's hand. Me refused to obey the order of the divisional commander. O'Shea told him to resign. He offered his resignation along with 13 other constables. Later on the 18th of June, District Inspector Thomas Flanagan, in a private meeting with the constables, advised them to all stick together. A message was received from headquarters in Tralee that all constables were to be present themselves on parade on the following morning at 10 o'clock. Closer to 10.30, four Crossley tenders drove up with a variety of dignitaries from high-ranking police officers and decorated senior military officers to include Colonel Smith and General Tudor, who was the police advisor to the Viceroy of Ireland. In addition, there were 15 armed, helmeted policemen and soldiers, a force of 50 strong. Colonel Smythe, the new divisional commissioner for the military and police of Munster, addressed the men. He made no reference for the refusal to follow orders and said that he had been appointed by the Prime Minister. He was to relay instructions, commands and details of the new postings, orders and strategies to include new night raids accompanied by military and ambushes five or six nights a week, to arrest civilians and at any sign of resistance they were to shoot first and ask questions later. There was to be no prosecutions for such behaviour and no inquests into any such activity. Constable Mee, as the spokesman, stepped forward and pointedly stated that they were not going to cooperate and he returned his English cap, belt and bayonet which he placed on a table. Smith ordered Mee to subsequently be arrested and led out, quickly followed by his supporters who scuffled with the arresting team and surrounded Mee as they entered an adjacent room. A conciliatory General Tudor then met with the constables, whom he tried to appease. 
The remaining military, having found that the telephone lines were cut, now also felt exposed and threatened, and they subsequently left the barracks. Me quickly recorded a contemporaneous note detailing precisely what Colonel Smith had said in his address to the men, something Smith was to try and deny later. Some of the constables present signed the back of the note, which was later handed to Father Charles O'Sullivan, who was responsible for sending it up to Dublin as quick as possible. After the military left the barracks, and over the next subsequent two to three weeks, there was no official communication from the authorities. Yet, in an attempt to break resistance, RIC pay was significantly increased with greater improvement in promotion and conditions. This concerned the mutineers that they may not get further open support that could be relied upon. On the 6th of July in 1920, it was decided by five key people that no purpose would be gained by staying on in the barracks and they would leave their posts the following day. This was Constables Me, Donovan, Fitzgerald, Hughes and Shearer. The Divisional Inspector Flanagan was informed and Father Charles O'Sullivan gave each man a character reference and as a letter of testimony. The next day, on the 7th of July, the five men left the barracks. All but Sheeran travelled together from Listowel to Limerick by train, where they took a car and then drove to Galway. Sheeran, knowing that they were now all marked men, travelled separately to Strayed, where he laid low for a while. When Patrick Sheeran eventually returned to his wife in Brosna, he was visited almost daily by the local RIC sergeant, to try and persuade him to rejoin the force. He was offered financial inducements and advancement on the force, but he remained steadfast. He was also approached by volunteers, Sinn Féin and IRA members. His reply to all was simple. He had left the RIC because he did not want to head out and shoot Irishmen, armed or unarmed. He was not going to do this for anyone. He subsequently developed expertise in building and construction and received commissions to construct Garda Barracks in Quinn, County Clare, Temple Atlantin, County Limerick and a school in Six Mile Bridge, also County Clare. As a result of his refusal to join the other side post-mutiny, he received no such commissions in the County of Kerry. With Margaret Morrissey, he went on to raise a family of six children, Rachel, John, Bridget, Edmund, Mary and Patrick. Perfect. In our